Welcome to Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples together with Eric Rostad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectual scientists, and others. And we'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about these important works. Today, we're going to cover the classic management book, The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker, a book focused on managing oneself for effectiveness. The effective executive, that is. It's not so much the effective executive as as I pretty much read it in my head all the time, but after reading it, I think it's really more the effective executive, which is pretty rare as it turns out. True, true. So Matt Mullenweg is the, the person who recommended this book in Tools of Titans. He is the co-founder and lead developer of WordPress. Have you, have you heard of WordPress? I, you know, I, I've seen it around the internet here and there, I think. Or, you know what? No, actually, come to think of it, I think I read about it. Uh, isn't it in Dickens? Before that, man, before that. Uh. Um, so WordPress powers about 25% of the web. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, as I pretty much make my living off of using WordPress. So thank you, Matt. I, uh, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to you. If you've ever been on, oh, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, TED, NFL, Reuters, or even the Books of Titans website, all of those are on WordPress. So um, thank you, Matt. The author of this book is Peter Drucker, very, very famous management guru, uh, probably before they started using guru in, in more of the later uh social media days of the social media ninjas and, and gurus yeah actually but, uh, what's funny is is drucker actually has a uh has a ha, there's a, a famous quote of drucker's about being called a guru <laughs> <laughs> so he, he hated it he hated being called a guru uh the quote is i've been saying for many years that we are using the word guru only because charlatan is too long to fit into a headline wow. that's pretty good um uh, <laughs> He's considered the single most important thought leader in the world of management. So that's a, that's a pretty good good title. He wrote 39 books. It probably helped. And uh, he had a cat named Snowy. He passed away in 2005, <laughs> so he's no longer with us. Um, you can't find him on Twitter. But he yeah. does have an institute, and uh, they're pretty active with um, trucker-related material. Well, I mean, the other thing that you got to remember is that this is a guy who uh, grew up in Austria-Hungary, Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, was received, you know, your full gymnasium education in uh, in post world one post world war one uh, 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 Vienna, I believe. And then uh, and then eventually, uh, as the Nazi party was starting to rise in uh, in Germany, wound up uh, leaving Germany in the in the 30s for England uh, and then eventually uh, uh Eventually came to, uh, uh, or eventually married a woman in uh, in uh, in London, I believe, in the 30s, and then came to uh, came to the United States in 1940, or in, came to the United States shortly after that, and then uh, and then lived in the U.S. the rest of his life. So he's a guy who saw a lot of things over the course of his life, and I think a lot of the um, of the stuff in this book, uh, he's is is in in light of all of the uh, of the specter of the of the evil that he had he had witnessed and that he had uh, he had sort of been confronted by uh, in the mid 20th mid 20th century and i think i think a lot of that underlies a lot of this book mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so in this episode we're going to start with the overview instead of going right into the quotes we'll, we'll hit that a little bit here but the overview i wanted to start off just first with some some definitions that drucker gives about the title of the book and what makes an effective, as uh, Jason pointed out, executive. So he defines effectiveness as working on the right things as a, as a knowledge worker. So with manual work, uh, mowing a yard, doing something like that, you, that can be measured by efficiency, how, how efficient you, you complete the task. Knowledge work can be measured by effectiveness or the ability to get the right things done. Uh, effectiveness, he says, is a habit. It's a complex of practices, so it can be learned. Uh, it's you're not you're not born with effectiveness. It's something that it takes practice and and good habits. Uh, the executive. This is how he defines the executive. 
It's those knowledge workers, managers, or individual professionals who are expected by virtue of their position or their knowledge to make decisions in the normal course of their work that have significant impact on the performance and results of the whole. And it's another term that, that Drucker's famous for is, is knowledge workers. So if, if you're in front of a computer all day or, or looking at data and making decisions, um, looking at big data, uh, you, you are a knowledge worker and our, our economy has obviously shifted from from manual work uh, to to knowledge work uh, over the the past uh, decade. So that's uh, that's kind of some insight into to where Drucker's coming from. Uh, I found the book. Uh, I just, I loved it. I, it. It was short, but it was meaty. Uh, I, I I was I was just stunned at how how many good good little snippets of info and um, really how he caused you to, to think through what it means to be effective. Uh, that uh, wonderful book. I, I loved it. I, I, I felt like I could have underlined the entire book. Yeah, it, um, it, I, I agree with that. I mean, it's, I, I kept, I kept just marveling to myself. There, there are only a few books I've ever read that just cut straight and straight down, like, you know, no words wasted, just cut straight to the heart of a matter so well and uh, and so often and in some cases so painfully yeah. as this one. I mean, he is his insight and his ability to basically say, well, you know, you hear people talking about doing it this way or, you know, this being a problem or whatever. But the real problem is that and just he puts his finger on something and you're just like, oh, oh, that's <laughs> devastating. And it's so clearly and obviously right. And I need to work on that. You know, it's, it's an immediate like, ouch. <laughs> Yeah. over and over again in this book and yeah i really wish i'd read this earlier in life yeah yeah me too and uh well it's it's funny because i i my degrees are in business and i vividly remember economics 101 in school and what do they teach you are these scarce resources well labor Cap capital capital, capital and, and labor yeah capital and labor exactly what, what does Drucker say is the most scarce resource? Time. Time. Yeah, and that and and Drucker's right. Time time is the only thing. It's it's sort of uh, it sort of reminds me of um, Drucker does with time what Mark Twain once did about about land. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Twain once said, you know, buy land. Uh, they ain't make it, or they aren't making any more of it anytime soon. Yeah. And uh, I probably mangled that quote a little bit, but you know you can you can look it up for those of you who are, uh, uh, you know, concerned about word perfect accuracy there. But you know, basically that that's the same the same is true. That's the same concept that Drucker is getting at with time, saying, listen, you can always make more money. You can you can go and you can, you know, get reimbursed on this, or you can find a way to make up for a money mistake. But you can never get back the you can never get back the last moment. You can never get back the last year. You can never get time back. It's gone permanently. Mm -hmm. And he, he again, that's that's one of those things. Well, you know, lots of people talk about labor and capital being scarce. Oh, come on. There's plenty of workers out there. You're never going to run out of workers. And there's so much capital out there. You know, are we really limited in terms of capital? Yeah, well, maybe that maybe, it, you know, we can fight over it for some, to some degree and maybe it's limited. But the real limitation that we're all under is we're mortal. Mm hmm. And, it and just, we've seen this pop up in a lot of the of the books we've read so far for this project. Uh, but for, for him to put it in those terms, it was just kind of one of those things like that's that's a basic tenet of, of what you learn <laughs> in business school. And and I, I think he nailed it. I, th I think they're they're wrong in, in, in teaching it that way, that labor and capital capital are the, the scarce resources um, when when time really is. And, and I know this book is more about the, the individual uh, in, as opposed to a, a full economic system or a, or a company. But still, I, I think the, the point is, is well made that um, that uh, that time is the the scarce resource. And as he put, the supply of time is totally inelastic. So, yeah. And, and, and I mean, of course, that's economics language. And, and, and this that actually reminded me a little bit of, a, of the first time that it kind of dawned on me that that particular aspect of things. I actually was listening. There's an old preacher who talked about um, an uh, old preacher named Paris Reedhead, actually, who uh, who talked about uh, the relationship between money and time. And, you know, we all, you all hear, well, you know, time is money, and you, you hear these cliches. But 
the thing is, you know, you talk about the scarcity of money and all this. What uh, what that old preacher pointed out, uh, which was just revelatory to me at the time, still is, was all money is is liquid time. Mm-hmm. So time is money is actually is actually true, and all money is is a way to represent the the investment of time and effort and all of those other things in a way that can be exchanged since you can't you know I, oh I'm going to trade you last year for you know for your next year or whatever you can't do that exactly but what you can do is you can place a value on what you do with your time that then you find some sort of exchange medium a medium to uh, to uh, uh, to represent it. And then you can exchange that as a way of representing the effort and time and all the other things that have come that are really just ways of representing time. Even capital, even even labor are just ways of representing time. Mm-hmm. Labor is how much effort and work you, you're putting in over a specific po- point, uh, over a specific uh, amount of time. And so that's what that is. And then capital is... A little bit more complicated, but it, you know, it's 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 the uh, uh, accrual of v- valuable resources and and you know raw materials and all these other things that are available uh, in limited quantities in large measure because of what has been what time has been put in before to either mine or make those materials available, or they're limited because you know you can't you can you can only obtain so much of them in over so much time. So again, time really is the, the thing in all of this. And and he just, I mean, again, he, he, in such a pithy way, just points out, yeah, time is the one inelastic thing. Well, and that's at the beginning of the book and it really sets the tone for the rest of the book because, uh, one of, one of the points, um, and the subtitle for the book is the definitive guide to getting the right things done. So if you if you do have that limited time, then it then it becomes absolutely important to be effective with the use of that time, and that's uh, and that's what the the rest of the book pretty much goes into then to uh, to cover how to how to be an, an effective executive. Yeah. And, and one 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 other thing I wanted to bring up in this the overview section is uh, the the other thing that at least in my mind when I think of executive I think of like three or four people of a company the CEO the CIO the CFO. And one other C something, um, but what he what he <laughs> maybe CTO, at, yeah. What he's getting at with executive is it's anyone who is making decisions on uh, throughout the normal course of their work. But, and that, knowledge workers in in any way, right? Any any yeah. knowledge worker who makes decisions on the basis of what they what they learn or know. Yeah. So don't don't let the title of this book scare you away. Like, oh, okay, I'm, I, maybe I'll read this in twenty years when I'm in, in uh, a CEO or or a higher up in the company. Like, this this is for anyone working in the knowledge knowledge area. Yeah, I mean, he defines executive very literally in the sense of a person who executes things, like yeah. a person who who does something, who who is responsible for uh, actually some some for executing some sort of task and you know and specifically he gets to that decision making thing and one of the points that he makes and it's just amazing how prescient this book is i mean it written in 1967 and he's got so much in here about the impact of computing and computers on knowledge workers and on the importance of how businesses need to be run and uh, the importance of effectiveness among executives and how computers are basically as they infiltrate and, you know, proliferate, uh, throughout various business organizations and organizations in general, whether, you know, business or otherwise, computers have a way of essentially making more and more workers, knowledge workers, or more and more workers, executives in some way, shape or form, and so, you know, his argument, you know, there were some uh, in the in the 60s who would, who would argue that computers are going to take, you know, are, are going to are going to uh, uh, eventually make the, make decisions for us. And computers are eventually going to, you know, eliminate the need for uh, executives in lots of ways. And his argument was exactly the opposite, saying, no, 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 no. Computers are just logic machines 
And the more dependent we become on computers and the more we use computers, the more information that's going to be there uh, for us to, to use and the, the greater premium that's going to put on decision making and on executive function and all that. And it's going to require more executives, not fewer. And mm. I think looking on this uh, 50 years later, I, I think it's hard to argue that uh, that he didn't again, hit that one absolutely out of the park. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, as we go into our next section here of, of quotes, we each have, again, quite a few. Um, and, and <laughs> I, I, could have, I, mean, I, I, was I just, could have gone with the whole book on this. I know. And, that, and that's the thing. I mean, I was just re- looking through the book again, and, and I was like, man, this, this is a really good one too, but I, I'm just going to stick with these. So my first one is uh, starts off like this. The fundamental problem is the re- reality around the executive. Unless he changes it by deliberate action, the flow of events will determine what he is concerned with and what he does. And this is uh, towards the towards the beginning, um, where he defines that if if uh, if the executive does not go in with a plan, if if uh, he just goes in and, and expects to or, or or reacts to things, he's going to constantly be reacting instead of being proactive, and uh, that that really sets the tone for for everything after of um and, and relates to time where he's got to be in control of his time and, he, and if he if he even from day one starts he or she lets um lets the the surrounding events within the company dictate what he does he's done for um so that that was my first uh my first favorite quote you want do, would you like to share yours? yeah i suppose i can go into my into my uh into my first one And again, it cuts right to the heart. Brilliant men are often strikingly ineffectual. They fail to realize that the brilliant insight is not by itself achievement. They never have learned that insights become effectiveness only through hard, systematic work. And again, that is so packed. Uh, you know, again, this gets back to this idea. If you're an entrepreneur or if you're, if you're in any sort of thing where you've got great ideas, great ideas are, are not valuable unless there's some sort of path taken, unless there's some actionable, uh, unless there's some action taken on them. Mm -hmm. The ideas are just fantasies. And then at the same time, the way that he puts this, he doesn't just say insights become effectiveness only through hard work. It's through hard, systematic work. Mm-hmm. Again, it's, it, it, and, and later on, he's got another quote about how ineffective people tend to work a lot harder in many cases than effective people. It's just for no real benefit. They don't actually get anything of worth done with how hard they work. So that's two sides of it. And, and again, he's so careful in how he parses his words here that it's not enough to be brilliant. And in fact, efficient, uh, effectiveness doesn't require brilliance, but it's not enough to be brilliant or to be brilliant. What you have or what you must have in order to be effective is systematic, is a systematic approach that then is applied rigorously through hard work. And that can work even if you don't have brilliant, a, a brilliant man or brilliant ideas. So, you know, I, I love that quote because, I, I, you know, again, as an academic, I've been around a lot of brilliant people and some of whom are indeed strikingly ineffectual. So, I mean, I, I, I see this and, uh, you know, I, I regardless of how brilliant I am or, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's another question. But uh, the question is, you know, what is it going to take to not be strikingly ineffectual? And, you know, I think uh, this book is, is a great reminder of, of a lot of those factors. Mm-hmm. My second one is, it is generally a waste of time to talk to a reader. He only listens after he has read. <laughs> and, uh, this, I, I just got to chuckle out of, out of this one because um, my wife can relate to, to this one uh, uh, about me <laughs> in the sense of uh, I, she, she'll tell me stuff and I just don't, don't even hear it. And, well, uh, well, just to put this in perspective, me. just to put this in perspective for the listener, this is in a section where he's talking about there's two types of people in an organization, Generally, and, and very few people combine the two, but there are people who do combine the two. But generally speaking, there are two types of people. There are listeners and there are readers. And, it's a, and that, that's when he says, 
it's a waste of time to talk to a reader. <laughs> yeah. And you are a reader without question. Yeah. That's why you're so, doing this podcast. Yeah. So I, I, I thought that one was funny. Um, so yeah. And, and, and you were saying, uh, your wife, uh, has to deal with this all the time because she, she'll say something to you, but, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I have no recollection and, and she, she'll have said it mul- multiple times. <laughs> so we're, we're I'm, I'm trying to get better at it, but we're also trying to maybe figure out a, a way where, whether it's uh, email or text or something. Um, uh, if I see it in print, I, it, it, for some reason it sticks in my mind more. And, um, so I, I <laughs> resonated with, uh, with that kind of uh, funny, funny quote. Yeah. And I'm a little bit of both. I'm, I, I think I'm kind of a, a rare case where I'm both a, a reader and, and a listener in that sense. But in terms of, of busy, of being busy, uh, I, I often tell people, don't tell me, <laughs> don't tell me this. You better send it to me. You better do something so that I can get it on the calendar so that I can store it away on a to-do list or something, or it ain't happening. Cause you know, yeah. you get, you get the busy part of that. So I think that's well, also and, a factor. Uh, it brings about to mind a, a story where, uh, it, for grad school, I did a trip where I needed to, to meet entrepreneurs in, a, in another country. And, and I was meeting with a, a local management professor here at Emory university in, in Atlanta. And this guy's very, very well known in, um, in the marketing world and, and just, a a, a brilliant, brilliant man. And, and, um, with my group, I, I sat down to meet with him and I said, can you do this, this, and this? And he just cut me off. And he said, I need you to send me an email with the exact things you need, send that to me. And then, I, and then I'll reply to that. <laughs> and it was, it was a good lesson because, you know, here I am asking him to remember a bunch of things and he just he just cut it off right at the beginning. He didn't even wait for me to finish, which was which was great. And he just said, "Just email it to me. I'll get it done." Yeah, that and that, the, I mean, the, it's the, helpful to know what what you are, and then and um and to get to get uh, information that way. Um, but probably also help to uh, to improve on on some of those areas, especially with when it comes to a spouse. Yeah, the busier you are, the more that I think is necessary. And, and again, with executives, uh, those who are knowledge workers and so on, uh, you know, today, especially with uh, information creep, uh, we're all, we all tend to be busy minded anyway. Okay, so the next one for me, this is the secret of those people who do so many things and apparently so many difficult things. They do only one at a time. As a result, they need much less time in the end than the rest of us. And <laughs> yeah, that uh, th- that's another big focus of this book. And in a time where we all tend to be multitaskers all the time and tend to be, you know, we're, oh, we're on our phone from this and we're, you know, the, it, the uh, you know, again, Drucker's not alive now. He died in 2005, but if, if he were alive today uh, to see the normal executive to use his term or the normal knowledge workers day he would be perhaps even more horrified by the constant barrage of interruptions that we not only have happened to us but that we willingly submit ourselves to mm-hmm. <laughs> and we talked about this you know in, in in the kevin kelly book and part of my uh sort of negative response to his discussions about the stream and living in the stream is my horror at wait a second like i try i'm i'm like i do a pretty i i try pretty hard to avoid interruptions in lots of ways i mean down to turning the notifications off of all my devices except for you know a couple things that uh you know text messages although i i'll have those on silent or whatever but aside from that you know notifications they're gone like no no audible dings i don't want badges on anything because I don't want to be, I don't want my eye drawn to a badge when I go to click on something on my dock, you know, and all of a sudden that breaks my, my concentration. And, you know, once your concentration's broken, you'll take 15, 20 minutes to get totally back focused again, if you're good. And well, that, that quote makes me think too of um, the, the saying, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. It's yeah. just by, by the fact that they're, in a good kind of busy, you, you have to prioritize, you have to, um, you have to be, to, to be good with your time. And, um, 
It made me think of that quote. Although if, if that busy person follows Drucker's uh, advice in this book, then he'll, uh, he or she will uh, often simply say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which that's another aspect of this book is uh, basically learning to uh, cut all of that, um, all of the unnecessary stuff, all the things that could be an interruption that, that the effective person may be busy, but that person is going to ruthlessly uh, restrict what's being done. Well, and I listened this morning, I listened to the uh, Cal Fussman interview of Larry King on the Ferris podcast, which, which uh, first off the Cal Fussman interviews on uh, the Ferris podcast are two of my favorite. And so to have Cal Fussman inter- uh, 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 interviewing genius interview Larry King, the master interviewer, it is pretty amazing. But Larry King on there, he said, no is the hardest word to say. And at Larry King's age, he says he still can't, he still can't tell people no. Yeah, I still so have a he, hard time with it. He has trouble with it. Um, so my next quote is, is uh, I'm going to read, it's, it's a little bit of a section here. In sports, we have long learned that the moment a new record is set, every athlete all over the world acquires a new dimension of accomplishment. For years, no one could run the mile in less than four minutes. Suddenly, Roger Bannister broke through the old record. And soon, the average sprinters in every athletic club in the world were approaching yesterday's record, while new leaders began to break through the four-minute barrier. And this, this, this is true on, on that high of a level, um, but I've also found it true in my life. And one, one of the reasons I, I really enjoy reading is uh, it, it, it opens my mind to things that I, I had never seen before or never, never understood, and, and especially... Um, I, I love running and, and there's been two books that have really had a major impact on running. And, and, and part of the impact is just, I never even realized some of these things were possible, like in terms of how far people could run, um, the things you could do to make running better, uh, or, or how you can make yourself faster. And, and it's, it's like, until you see the new dimension of an accomplishment, it, it's hard for you to see, it's hard for you to see past that point. So I, 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 I enjoyed that part of, uh, of him talking about, about that. It acquires a new dimension of accomplishment and then how that impacts everyone else. Yeah. And actually my next quote comes from that same passage. Um, I, uh, I, I, he, he points out in, in human affairs, the distance between the leaders and the average is a constant. And of course, he's fudging a little bit there, but the distance between the leaders and the average is a constant. If leadership performance is high, the average will go up. The effective executive knows that it is easier to raise the performance of one leader than it is to raise the performance of a whole mass. And again, why? Well, you get Roger Bannister that breaks through the mile and at four minutes and it basically, that, that's the example that he gives of, well, once Bannister did it, everybody else's performance, the average performance went up. Everybody else benefited from B- Bannister's, uh, Bannister's efforts. And I, I, I suppose, you know, maybe training, training things changed and, and, and whatever. But when the very top level improved, the levels below it improved and brought the average up. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that's that's a principle that 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 I think is is really interesting. And actually, uh, uh, one place where I've seen this uh, in action some uh, is in in football coaching, American football coaching. Uh, one coach I've known for about a decade now uh, talks about uh, Jimbo Fisher, uh, the head coach at Florida State, uh, talks about how you know he puts a lot of uh, responsibility on his quarterback. Uh, that the quarterback has to has to know more in, in you know at least when his offense is at uh, you know he's he's primarily an offensive coach uh, that that's where he coached before he was a head coach but uh, when his he he requires a lot of his quarterback and more than than a lot of coaches do uh, but he explains it he says listen it's a lot easier to teach one guy everything than to teach everybody most of the stuff. And, you know, instead of instead of having it so that the whole offense has to make this or that change here and there, he's he's going to have the the quarterback come to the line of scrimmage with say three play three different possible plays, 
in mind. And then the quarterback has to make all those decisions at the line of scrimmage. At least again, he'll adjust this for a younger guy or whatever. But his idea is if I can get that one guy to grasp everything else, then the rest of the offense is going to, is going to be able to raise to that level because he's going to help raise that offense to that level. And if you can get that one guy to know, to know it all, then everybody else is going to be better. So that's mm-hmm. one place. And then actually the other thing is uh, his tendency to uh, hold certain uh, leadership players. So his best players uh, to, to account. So, you know, he'll uh, over the, over the, over the years. And again, practices there tend to be closed, but uh, some, you know, those of us who are a little bit more connected as alums or whatever of the program uh, will have a little bit more access on that. But, you know, over the years, they've had all American players and all this that Fisher has held to a specific standard such that they're the guys that he kicks out of practice. They're the guys that he singles out for punishment. They're the guys that he's going to go after the hardest. And again, why? Well, if I hold my best players accountable and and everybody else on on this in this program is looking at those guys and say and seeing that I'm not letting them slide with this or that missed assignment or this or that thing that you know that happened then they know for sure that when it comes down to them making the mistake or them doing something wrong they're going to they're going to be just as accountable you start by holding the guys at the top accountable and all, and it trickles down from there this is kind of trickle down ac- accountability in some sense uh <laughs> And again, it's easier to focus on getting it right at the top there. And then that feeds down to produce a culture that ends up being higher, a higher achieving culture. And, and you know, this is the same thing that Nick Saban at, at Alabama, who, you know, I, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I don't personally know. But again, Jimbo Fisher at, at Florida State coached under Saban for quite a while and, and took a lot of this from him. Saban is very much uh, a, a, a one who, who goes by those sorts of things. And Saban is, uh, I think, a, a Druckerite in that sense as well, too. So, uh, you know, he, he tends to apply a lot of these particular lessons in his program, as does Fisher and as do, as do a lot of the more successful uh, program builders in sports, not just football, but elsewhere. So, you know, these lessons apply across the board. That's, that's a, uh, especially a good one, though, that quote. That, that was amazing. Uh, my, I'm just going to finish off with one more here, and it's the, the self-development of an effective executive is true development of the person. Effectiveness is not a subject, but a self-discipline. And so as we get to the end of this book, his, his point is that the development of the executive, it's, it's not just to get better at business. It's not just to, to be more effective at decision making, but it's actually going to run into your life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to develop you as a person. Uh, one, one party talks about asking how you can contribute most to a company and, and trying to focus on that one thing. And when you focus on that one thing, you're going to find out where you're lacking knowledge. And so you go to get that knowledge and that builds you as a person, it builds you as, as a, as a worker. Uh, but, but I like that he tied that all together. The self self development of an effective, effective executive is true development of the person. That's uh that that was my uh, my one of my final favorite favorite quote there. Uh, but as we said, that so many in the book that could have shared here. Yeah, and again, that 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 quote reinforces the idea that this book is not just for CEOs or whomever. It's it's for everyone. This mm-hmm. is a book of philosophy as much as it is anything else, and it's about self mastery, which applies to everyone. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, I got a few more as usual. I. Uh, I, I loaded up on the favorite quotes, uh, but again, I could have put another hundred in here easily. Uh, this is a really good one, though. By themselves, character and integrity do not accomplish anything, but their absence faults everything else. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> Because, you know, this is where he's talking about, you know, effective executives staff from strength. They, they try to find where a person is strong and, and use those strengths rather than trying to find someone with no weaknesses. He says, no, you find someone who's got strengths and you've, and you've put those strengths in, in play and you try to find a way to, you know, accommodate the weaknesses because everybody's going to have weaknesses. And if you're going to have an effective person, they're always going to have weaknesses. We'll talk about that probably later in the, in the program. But here, but then he says at the same, and he says, you know, if you're hiring on the basis of character and integrity, 
for your positions. If that's your criteria, then you're going to you're going to have an ineffective organization. And, you know, my initial response to that was like, you know, kind of negative. <laughs> you know, like, well, you know, you want people with integrity and character and all this. And, you know, this is this gets back to we've talked in the past about uh, you build culture first and you, you, you know, concern yourself with people first and and tasks second and all that. Well, Drucker kind of flips that a little bit and he says, yeah, people first. But the main thing is you have to get somebody that actually fits the job. And you have to find and if and if you can't find somebody to fit the job, then you need to change the job so that someone can do it and then hire for the job. And you can't just hire someone because they're a nice guy. You can't hire someone because she's a good woman. And his, you know, one of the other quotes there is, you know, good for what? <laughs> yeah. Well, and what's what's uh, what's good is that next week's book is who, uh, which which covers this, you know, who, who to hire. And um, I found myself writing a lot of notes of, of comparing or finding agreement between what what Drucker wrote and then what the authors of, of who wrote. So uh, th- yeah, we'll, that'll be that'll be good next week to uh, we'll definitely to discuss the connection further. there. Yeah. 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 But um, but but yeah, there, but, but I love how he says if you don't have character and integrity, however, that can poison everything else. So you yeah. have to be careful that you, you know, understand what weaknesses are there. And, you know, there's a certain point, though, where you have to cut your losses because the person's weaknesses override their strength. But I, I, I like the way that he talks about that, that character and integrity in this regard are not a positive good so much as they're a negative good, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, the, they're the sort of thing that they subtract the faulting of everything else uh, rather than, you know, creating value in and of themselves. Next is the man of knowledge has always been expected to take responsibility for be- for being understood. It is barbarian arrogance to assume that the layman can or should make the, uh, make the effort to understand him and that it is enough. If the man of knowledge talks to a handful of fellow experts who are his peers, <laughs> And that makes me think of the buck up, suck up book where they, they talked about that as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, and this is Drucker was a, you know, he, he was, he had a professorship. He was a professor for many, many years. And this is his rebuke to his fellow academicians, right? All these people who are writing for high level academic journals that not a soul outside of the field could understand. Yeah. And he's saying, listen, if that's the extent to which your do your work is going, then you are not effective. Huh. You and not only that, you are you are showing barbarian arrogance <laughs> to assume that your work will have should have any effectiveness if you're not translating it and working it down to be understandable by the layperson. So he flips the the usual economy of academic work on its head and scholarship on its head, because, you know, in scholarship, popular level books are so frowned upon. And the idea of, you know, reaching out so, and, and trying to train the layman, that is the sort of thing that does not get you tenure and it doesn't get you promotion and all this. And it's publication in these high level, top tier, high impact factor, uh, peer reviewed journals that really only a handful of people might read at any given, you know, Let's say, you know, if, if you have 100 fellow scholars in your field actually read your article in one of those, you are you are a, you are a rock star. Yeah. And Drucker's like, wait, so you're going to you're writing this for 100 people. It's only going to affect them. Well, geez, you're really ineffective and you've wasted a lot of time. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he, he takes a number of pot shots at the uh, culture of academia in that regard uh, as, you know, people who. In, in, I think, in fairness, don't have the skill set, don't have the capacity, didn't develop the capacity to do the work that is productive, like what Drucker's doing in this book. Mm-hmm. They don't do it in part because they can't do it. And then, of course, the system is governed by those people who really can't do it. And so all the incentives are placed such that people can do the thing that they can do, which is talk among themselves. <laughs> Just talk among yourselves, guys. Um, well, and I, I mean, to that point, I mean, I find the best business books are the shortest ones, and, and this is a this is a short one, but it but it it does show a, a enormous level of intellect to be able to write and to uh, to put everything into that short of a book and concise of a book. Uh, so 
Yeah, he, he really did. That. Yeah, it's not the it's not the long book that's the, that's the uh, that's the the really truly brilliant one. And I say this as someone whose <laughs> PhD dissertation was just under eight hundred pages, and I like well, to think well, that it well, was. Uh, yeah, I like to think that it was a, a piece of brilliance, but you know, the real brilliance will be to boil that down to a popular level book of about one hundred and fifty pages, which is the plan. Yeah, uh, but, but you've had to you've had to to put that down into a, a PowerPoint presentation too. And I know it didn't go into everything that was in your dissertation, but, but you have done that exercise as oh, well. Yeah. I mean, I can, uh, I can summarize it in five minutes for a layperson to, to understand and actually make sense of and benefit from potentially. But, uh, the problem in, you know, the reason that I had to write 800 pages is because there's, there was, a, there's, you know, lots of potential pushback and to prove the point, uh, sometimes you have to spend all that extra time, you know, covering all the potential bases of, of possible resistance. But, once that's done, then you can boil it down, and and it, you need to boil it down, in my view, for the uh, for the layperson. Mm-hmm. Couple final ones. Uh, the recurrent crisis is simply a simple symptom of slovenliness and laziness. <laughs> so, no, no, no mincing of words here. Yeah, he is he is brutal in his in his uh, uh, in his candor here. So if you keep having, you know, a, a, a recurring crisis, it's just because you're slovenly and lazy. I wonder if he did any consulting in like, you know, in the meeting with the, the executives of a company. And, well, you know, this is happening because you're, you're of your laziness and, and sloven, slovenliness. Uh, that, see him doing that, just being straight to the point. I, I can't imagine him not saying exactly that although I, I i very much imagine him with that thick australian or i mean thick australian god i'm leaving that in there that thick austrian accent uh you know oh you're doing this simply because of your laziness barbarian arrogance <laughs> so my final two Again, this one is directed very much at me and other academics as much as anybody knowledge work is not defined by quantity Ouch, especially yeah. again in an academic world where, you know, path to tenure and all this is quantified precisely by, well, how many peer reviewed articles do you have? How many uh, how many uh, peer reviewed uh, scholarly monographs have you published? I mean, how many how many citations have you have you gotten? What's your impact factor? All that stuff. All that's quantity. And he's saying, yeah, knowledge work, not so much defined by that. And if you try to define knowledge work that way, you're going to fail. And as it turns out, we're having a lot of problems in academia because people game that system precisely as he would expect. And he goes on in that same passage where he says, you know, an, a, an ineffective executive might spend much of, so much of his time hunting down details, the footnotes academicians so often mistake for research, as to see and hear nothing and to think even less. <laughs> And again, it, it gets back to, I, I mean, I, ha- I recently had a Twitter interaction with a, uh, with a fellow, fellow scholar, actually a person who had been in, a, in the same graduate department as, as I was, and I challenged something that this person had said, and, uh, you know, because it didn't make sense, uh, and this person basically came back with a series of cita- a string of citations, at which point I basically said, that's very nice, and I can match citations with you if you'd like, but it still doesn't actually answer the fundamental problem that what you said is self-refuting. <laughs> and I, you know, responded with a couple additional, you know, citations, you know, this had to do with, with case law in terms of uh, U S history and all that. And then, you know, the response basically was, well, this is my area of expertise. Well, that's, that's fine, but it doesn't mean that you actually thought about it and just listing citations doesn't make it research. And one other person stepped in and was like, well, yeah, but only one of one of the people in this conversation, because there were several that had joined in, mostly uh, joining on my side, as it turned out. But several others who joined in hadn't hadn't you know, cited anything. And it was like, well, I only see one person who's really showing research in this and who's really you know, backing up uh, the points by citations or whatever. And my response was citations don't back anything up. That yeah. just tells you someone else said something question is whether the argument works and so, that so do you, do you have any original thoughts of your own or are you just going to spout off <laughs> are you going to plagiarize the whole thing for us do you have any thoughts of, of your own on this matter yep and uh <laughs> good, goodwill hunting comes to the rescue one more time with uh, yet another pithy uh statement of reality 
And the final quote is actually probably my favorite quote uh, in the book. Uh, in, and that is, do first things first, and second things, not at all. The alternative is to get nothing done. Yeah, he has a good section on delegation for those second things uh, that probably probably need to be done. But if 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 you're effect if you're going to be effective, you've got to do the first things, and the second not at all. But that is hard <laughs> to do, man. <laughs> well, even with the delegation, he talks about those how really those aren't second things. Those are the things that need to be done for the first things to be done. You don't delegate second things. You don't even have them done. If they're if it's something that's that's derivative, it's second. You you generally just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's that's really really hard, really yeah. hard. And I'm terrible at it. So we can move on to the next section now, uh, into the a little bit more detailed stuff, uh, a little bit more of our analysis interaction with the book itself. Uh, so, uh, Eric, I, I believe you are up on this, uh, talking about the, uh, the conscious effort. Yeah. My first nitty gritty point here is the, where he's talking about the executive having to make an immediate conscious effort to look outside of the company and the organization. And I, I kind of hit on that at the very beginning where we were talking about, he's got to, uh, he or she, uh, has got to go in and, and not let the immediate things of the company affect him or her, he's got to make a conscious effort to look outside and, and look at the customer, the, you got to look at the, the person purchasing the product or service first, instead of the, the internal, uh, what's going on, because that, that will quickly consume the, the time. So that was just a, a good point. I thought he had just to start things off of, of, if you, if you don't do this first thing of making a conscious effort to, to set the priority straight right away, uh, it, nothing else is going to matter in this book. So it was a good, uh, good starting point there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, not much to add there again. I, I think the point being that, uh, most, uh, executives do exactly the opposite that they're man they're, they, they become managers of the internal stuff. But in reality, good executives have to constantly be thinking about how the inner, the out, the inside interacts with the outside. Mm hmm. Um, let me see my first, uh, the first thing that, that, uh, I wanted to get to in this section, I already kind of touched on actually, uh, but it's the, the quote where he says, whoever tries to place a man or staff in organization to avoid weakness will end up at best with mediocrity. The idea that there are well-rounded people, people who have only strengths and no weaknesses, whether the term used is the whole man or the mature personality or the well-adjusted personality or the generalist is a prescription for mediocrity, if not for incompetence. Strong people always have strong weaknesses, too. I, I, there's one of those, you know, again, those counterintuitive kind of statements and sections that really hit me hard there in the sense of more often than not, you see, you see the way that people try to, to do hiring, and this is especially true in academic work, where you know you're trying to find someone who who's going to be a good fit and is well rounded whereas the really great performers are rarely well rounded in anything yeah and, Dr and Drucker gives some examples and in, in, in for me as well that was that was something that that struck me um, but he, even as examples uh, of, uh, of of an author where uh, the author dabbled in in these other other scientific areas but the author is remembered for being an author and not, you know, if, 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 if that person, if that writer had not written, um, history would not note that, uh, that the person had done, had dabbled <laughs> in the science. So, uh, and, and he gives other examples, even, even people that we think of, uh, are, are these well-rounded whole, whole people. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely struck up, stuck out to me. And, and back to some of the other books that we've read, uh, some of them have good points that are obvious, but uh, and we've mentioned this before in, in other podcasts, but some of the ones that stick out the most are these counterintuitive ones that, that really make you think and then strike you as, as, as the non-obvious ones. Um, so that, that's another yeah, example I love, here. I, I love the, 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 the story when, uh, where he says, uh, Lincoln, upon being told about uh, how uh, Ulysses S. Grant had a drinking problem, 
<laughs> he asked about what brand of uh, what brand of whis- or what was it scotch or whiskey? What brand did he uh, did he drink? Be- uh, find out what brand he drinks and then uh, send it send it to my other generals. Yeah, <laughs> because Grant, yeah, he had a major weakness, but he also had the strengths that made him the general for the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and actually the, the other, uh, quote, there was another quote in this section that I thought applied actually to me. Uh, you know, one of the issues that, uh, my, uh, doctoral advisor mentioned that I, I would have probably going on the, on the job market, uh, after finishing my PhD would be that, uh, that some, uh, some, faculty, you know, some committees would, would see me as too much of a generalist and others would see me as too much of a specialist. And he said, oh. you're, you're kind of a rare candidate in that you've got the possibility of being labeled either one. Uh, and you know, that normally, you know, you tell somebody to, who might be thought of as too much of a generalist to try to downplay some of that and to, you know, to try to find ways to really tailor themselves for the position. He said with me, it's, you can't, I can't really do that. Um, and it got and and it got me to this because I don't really think of myself as a generalist in that regard, but I am a specialist in a number of areas. You know, try I try to add areas of specialty as I get really interested or as something ends up butting up against another area of specialty where if I really want to know it, I need to expand my area of specialty. And I think his definition really works. The only meaningful gener- definition of a generalist is a specialist who can relate his own small area to the universe of knowledge. Maybe a few people have knowledge in more than a few small areas, but that does not make them generalists. It makes them specialists in several areas. And I I like that a lot because again, you know, the the generalist thing is, is hard because there's so many things that I don't know. So many things that anybody who might be labeled a generalist just doesn't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, first of all, you learn how to learn. And so I might not know something now, but I can I can learn it. Uh, you know, you might not know something now, but you can always go and look it up and learn how to learn how to 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 get along there. But that doesn't necessarily make you an expert in that area. It doesn't make you a specialist there. It takes a little longer to become a specialist, but you can be a specialist in several areas and then learn to relate those together, which can potentially make you more valuable. Uh, and and to me. Uh, actually the, the people who are most valuable, uh, are those who are, are specialists, but learn to have, and this connects to your first point, learn to look outside their own area of specialty to see the bigger picture and how, how you can put more than one piece together. Uh, and you know, this is the, the clumper splitter kind of definition that you get in, in, or a division that you get in scholarship, where to me, yeah, it's necessary to have the people who who split things and can uh, figure out. Well, you know, you have to parse these things apart, and you, you know, you can't treat these exactly the same, and really show the complexity of things. But the true brilliance is the people who have enough expertise to then take those things that you recognize as needing to be treated in a complex manner, and finding a way to integrate that into a larger uh, theoretical uh, model that 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 can explain more macro stuff. And, and that's, that's the real challenge a lot of times. And, and it takes in that case, someone who is a specialist in more than one tiny area to, to be able to do that sort of thing. But, uh, but I thought his, 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 um, his discussion there of, of, you know, why should you look for a well-rounded person? Should you really try to be well-rounded rather than being effective? No, try to be effective and, you know, learn to, to compensate for your weaknesses or learn to, to overcome your weaknesses. But understand that if you're going to have real strengths, you're probably going to, those are going to come with some weaknesses too. So are you a general specialist or a special generalist? Well, my mom always said I was special. So I think <laughs> I'll go with that one. Well, and this, this goes to the advice I give so many of my clients of get, get into your niche. I mean, you could dig deep into your niche. I mean, it's going to, as a website developer, I'm going to, I'm going to, do a much better job for you if you can define your niche to me and if you can go deep, if you can tell me your exact type of, of customer, the exact type of work that you do and uh, the exact target target audience, uh, we can we can do great work. Uh, but it's the generalist that I, I cannot help. I mean, the, the generalist that comes and says, I, I want to target the entire United States with, uh, <laughs> with this, this set of videos on uh, consulting. I, I can't help you. I'm sorry. 
but uh, the 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 more that we can get dig down deep into who who you who you serve, and and the 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 service or or product that you have, the the better that we can that we can do. Well, that overlaps nicely with the twenty two immutable laws of marketing, where they say you know if you can't show what your product isn't and who your audience isn't, then you don't have a product. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, the same thing actually with uh, buck up, suck up. Uh, you know, those guys talked about it in the political realm, saying, you know, if your opponent, if your political opponent can say yeah to all of your platform ideas, then you don't have a platform. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. not a candidate. Yeah. So it's the same the same principle, and again, uh, Drucker does puts it extraordinarily well throughout this. Well, one thing I learned in this book is how to tell a well managed plant. So a <laughs> factory a one that's well managed yeah not 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 a uh, not a green plant uh you know or not 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 like a one that grows out of the ground but a factory right years ago when i first started out as a consultant i had to learn how to tell a well-managed industrial plant from a poorly managed one without any pretense to production knowledge a well-managed plant i soon learned is a quiet place a factory that is dramatic a factory in which the epic of industry is unfolded before the visitor's eyes is poorly managed a well-managed factory is boring. Nothing exciting happens in it because the crises have been anticipated and have been converted into routine. And that's just brilliant. I mean, but it's so true. If, if, if you run in something, if you go into somewhere and it's calm, collected, cool, it's, it's being well run. Things are going well. It's the, the chaos, the people screaming, the, 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 the person uh, getting getting anxious because he's not getting stuff done in time. Um, that's, uh, that's where you have something that's, that's very, uh, something that's not run well. And, and my, my wife is just brilliant at being able to walk in anywhere, any, uh, food, uh, restaurant, grocery store, anywhere. And she can tell how the management is of that, of that facility based on just a, a quick initial look at half a minute. Employees. Yeah. <laughs> employees, uh, how things are, are stacked, everything. And, and she's just brilliant. I mean, she would just be a brilliant consultant in that sense of being able to go in and, and help managers, uh, understand, understand what's going on. And potentially every bit as brutal as Drucker in her, in her judgments <laughs> or interviews on that, which is not, not a, not a, uh, I'm not saying anything negative at all there because it, it, that's precisely what's needed with the, with, with consultants, uh, and, yeah. and her attention to detail is, uh, is pretty, pretty amazing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So beyond that, um, a couple other things, uh, before we, before we wrap, um, I, I, I liked his, his points about how it's necessary to consolidate time. So, you know, he says, listen, a quarter of a working day, if consolidated in large time units, is usually enough to get the important things done. But even three quarters of the working day are useless if they're only available as 15 minutes here, or half an hour there. And man, have I found that to be the case in my life. Uh, and I, what I've found is really th what I need to be effective uh, and th this is before I ever read this book uh, and, you know, doing a writing a dissertation will teach you where you are and are not effective um, pretty quickly. But what I found is, generally speaking, if I'm going to be in a rhythm in, in any sort of rhythm of, of produ productivity, what I need is a couple of of. Con, uh, consecutive with a, enough time for a little bit of a break, uh, you know, whether for a snack or a quick uh, nap. I need a, I need basically two two hour segments of time uh, to really be at my maximum efficiency. And what I generally found, and this was until the last phases of the dissertation, I found that essentially four hours of really focused, productive work a day was extremely productive. And what would often happen once I went past four hours of really of really intense research and writing is my Actually, my the, the quality of it often started to fall off, and and if it didn't, you know, I might go eight or nine hours in one day if I really got on a roll, and then I'd have kind of a hangover the next day, uh, in in terms of uh, you know uh, having a little bit of a, a sort of a mental hangover, uh, and yeah, I found it's that it's actually hard hard to get work done that next day. Yeah, it's if, really hard. Out. Yeah, so what would happen is I I discovered that the sweet spot was 
four hours of really constructive, really, really focused work on whatever project I've got as my priority per day is really the sweet spot for me. Uh, and you know, I might be able to go up to five, uh, but after a while of doing, you know, more than say five, I'm going to burn out and I'm going to need some days off and so on to, 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 uh, to handle that. But if I'm able to get four hours, I can get more done in a consecutive four hour period. And I often use the Pomodoro technique of 20 minutes on five minutes off during those four hours. But if I get four hours of really consecutive time, I can get more done than I can get done in 12 hours that are broken up by that's broken up by periodic interruptions. Now, in the last f- stages of my dissertation, the last three months, I would, uh, according to my tracking software, I was uh, averaging over nine hours a day of focused writing uh, for seven. Uh, it was seven days a week, roughly. Well, it was about. It was over eight and a half hours a day. It was around nine hours a day of focused writing uh, and research stuff, you know, within within those uh, within the apps and and all that uh, necessary to do that. But around eight and a half to nine hours per day, seven days a week for three months, which and then, then how, many, how many how many hours a day running through the neighborhood naked to blow off steam? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the tracker fortunately didn't uh, keep keep track of that, but. Um, but no, that that was basically the uh, the the home the home stretch for for about three months, and then after that three months, I was I was I had a pretty extended hangover. Yeah. So, uh, but but I think his point about getting consecutive time of chunking your time, consolidating your time in large time units, is one of the most valuable lessons from this book. You know, you can you put that together with find out figure out what your first things are. And then chunk your time so that your first things get the primary attention and that there's no interruptions in that chunked time. And that right there is in, in, in my experience has been whenever I go away from that, I'm, I'm far less effective. Well, in, in part B of, of point number two, there is to then measure your time. Yeah. And, and you do a great job of this. And, and that's one question I, I, I had for you while reading this book is what, what did you learn using those time tracking tools and, and, how did that impact your work? I mean, you're obviously doing eight and a half hours of work, but did that help in how you use that time or how you broke up time? Yeah, it did. Um, you know, I used rescue time. I still do, uh, uh, which is, I think, a very useful time tracking tool for the computer. Uh, basically, anything, a- anywhere you have an active window uh, where you're actually doing work, it will track that time. Uh, as in that app, and then some apps or and and uh, your internet browser or whatever, it will uh, it will know like what document you're working in or what um, uh, what website you're on or whatever, and it'll it'll it, you can then uh, tell it what counts as very productive or productive or neutral or unproductive or distraction or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. and you know, you've got a, a, the ability to block distractions for however long you, you ask it to do and all that. But, uh, what I found was first of all, again, the, you know, anything, uh, the half an hour, a half an hour or an, even an hour, uh, uh, you know, doing something was rarely productive, rarely all that productive. I mean, it, it, if I logged it there, what, what I would find is I would, I, you know, that first little bit, you, you're kind of getting focused and you can see the graph going back and forth a little bit. But once you really get into the groove, once you've established that, that block without any distractions, uh, things, are, things are, are very productive. The other thing though, and this is more tied to the, to the tracker and what I learned with that is the tracker forces you to be honest uh, so what would happen is I, you know, I get the weekly report and I can check it on the daily if I want, but I get the weekly report and it says, here's what you did. And, you know, when you're working on a project and you want it and you say that it's the priority that you have, and then you get back and you find out that you spent like seven hours on it over the course of a week and you felt like you actually worked on it. You're like, I really didn't put any time into that. Mm-hmm. But you, but you know, what hap- what would happen is you'd go to, I would go to do something and then the urgent would would interfere, mm-hmm. and that honesty of well, that's actually where my time goes, and you know, kind of having to, to choke on my reality there, that's what really 
kicks in. And then the, the, the beauty of rescue time for me is, is in those last few months, I actually was pretty competitive with myself on, can I sustain this pace today? Can I stay focused? Can I, you know, get close to what I did yesterday? Can I, can I keep that productivity meter really high? Uh, you know, today, can I keep it over 90%? You know, can I keep it, you know, yesterday I was, I had a couple days where I was, you know, 10 plus hours at 98% of focus. And it's like, you know, can I do that again? (laughs) And then it becomes, you're, you're being honest with yourself and then you've got actual metrics that you can, you can shoot for in that case. And and if you can focus, once you get focused in those chunks of time, you can, you can be pretty productive. So you know, I, I think he's right about tracking time and forcing the honesty and, and the, the kind of impact that that can make. Yeah. And that's something I took away from the book and, and want, uh, want to look into uh, to doing on my devices so I can actually see where the time. I think I know where it goes. But if if what you're saying is, is true, which I, I I'm betting it oh, is. Oh, it's a little that, scary, man. That's scary and, and is going to require honesty with, with how you're actually using time. So Yeah, I found uh, myself in some cases just reading certain websites on my iPad because I didn't want the report <laughs> the report to come up on my on my computer that I'd been wasting that time. Uh, you know, so it just went down a zero, you know, zero logged on the computer. I, I, I must confess to doing that a few a few different times here and there. But uh, <laughs> well, and that, that quote makes me think too. Warren Buffett, who um, I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but I think it's as, as high as eighty percent of his day is spent reading, and that's not just like day, like from waking up to evening. That's his working day. So eighty percent of the time at work is spent reading, and then twenty percent is um, is is must be just unbelievably productive and effective effective time. And, and I know the reading is part of that. He's reading um, about companies. He's reading about the the people he's looking at investing in, but, um, but for, but for the, one of the wealthiest people in the world to spend 80% of their day reading, that's, uh, that's quite astounding. Yeah. Well, the, now, right, right about now I hear Jack Nicholson saying you have that luxury. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there, th- that, that is part of why he's successful and learning to read. And again, I think Drucker would say, well, that's great. He spends 80% of his time reading, but I guarantee you he's not reading spending 80% of his time reading novels, Drucker yeah. would say, well, yeah, reading the right things matters too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and learning to do that. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, unless you, do you have anything else here before we uh, get to the big picture? No, that was, that was it for me. Um, yeah. The big picture, this, this reminded me of a lot of themes that we've come across so far in some of the other, other books we've, we've discussed. Uh, the the main one, the importance of time, and I, we talked about that a lot in this podcast episode. But it uh, it, w- it played a prominent part in this book, and it, it's kind of the first first thing of 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 many that uh, that that has to be in place of of understanding the importance of time that that is the scarcest resource, and um, and then uh, acting accordingly. And I, I liked too that uh, that he that he took. You know, this isn't just so that you can go to your job and be a good little worker. Uh, it's it, this is this is a development of the whole person, and it's the development of a person in small habit forming steps, which impact other areas of your life, relationships, leading, uh, working, etc. So I, I like that. I, I just keep coming across that, and it's just something in my own life for for 2017 that I've I've come to to understand a, a lot deeper. And, and that's really the, the difference b- between goals and, and habits and, and how setting habits can, can lead to a lot deeper change and, and um, uh, impact than, um, than setting a goal and, and hoping to achieve it. But just in, in, and then with those habits, doing those on a, a continual basis every day and, 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 you know, not, not maybe seeing a change in a week, a month, uh, but but over time, seeing a, a change from those those changing habits. The the other thing I kept thinking when I was reading this book is he's talking about serving people, and I, I don't think he used the term, but that's what I just kept thinking of. And, and it's just even going into when you get into the company, uh, you 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 need to look outward. You need to look at what the customer wants. You need to serve the customer. And then when he's talking too about uh, as, as a consultant, you need to figure out how you can help them best 
and then how you can improve on that knowledge so you can help people even more, so you can you can serve them. And I really think that's the purpose of, of business, of, of, of working, uh, is, is to serve people. And, and I, I just, I, I liked how we talked about different things and, and how it, it's about, it's about the other. It's not, you know, the more, the more inward you focus on these things, the, the worst time you're going to have, a, have about it. And, uh, and, and he does, does the same thing also talking about, uh, you know, junior executives. If you're under, if you're not the chief executive, well, you, you know, what, what can make you effective? Well, find ways to make the guy above you or the woman above you effective. Yeah. Find ways to serve that. You know, if you, if you help them be, be effective, then you'll become effective. And then, you, you know, he says there are a few things that will put your, uh, your path to, uh, to promotion on a quicker, uh, a quicker, quicker upward trajectory than the people immediately above you getting promoted. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, so again, it's it, it's it's you're right. I mean, it, over and over again, I, I kept thinking that there were lots of that that he doesn't use the word, but it's over and over again about serving. I I, I saw the same thing. And my la- my last thing here is, is I have two degrees in business, and I I'd never read this book, and I just thought that was a shame because it 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 covers so much. I I don't know why we don't read these kind of books in in business school. It would be a lot more effective if I could use the term than. Uh, than these textbooks that we, that we get. Um, so I, I would put this one up there. This was, uh, from, from the books that I've read for this project so far, this is, this is in my top, uh, top five so far. I, I loved it. And, uh, um, it's one of those books I, I put up there with like 22 laws of, uh, of marketing, uh, and just a classic, a, a business classic that, um, that should be on the shelf should be easy to, uh, to go back and reference because it, a lot of wisdom and it's not, I, I read it in five days and it's a, it's a short, you know, you can, you can get through it really quickly and get some, get some wonderful lessons from it. Yeah. I bought the ebook of this, uh, late in the read, uh, and have every intention of periodically going back and revisiting this book because, uh, it, it's got a lot of really important reminders. Uh, but you know, I, I, again, it, I'm, I think this would be one that that kind of would be you, you get you talk about you know summer reading for for universities summer reading for high schools and these sorts of things. This is the sort of book that should be on all those lists. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it I don't I don't understand why uh, this is not one of those that that, that becomes or that that's emphasized much more well beyond the business community. Although I think the title uh, to some degree uh, keeps people from that. I mean I I. I probably wouldn't have read it outside of this, uh, this project in part because, you know, it's, well, okay, it's for executives. Mm. Yeah. But the reality is this is a book for everyone. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, there, there was just a ton to benefit from in this book. Uh, and it's one of the few books where over and over again, his projections about the future keep lining up with what we see. Uh, with what what we've seen, even you know his critiques of GM, which uh, you know at the time GM was super strong and seemed invincible, and he talked about how you know late in the book he talked about how well you know GM uh, uh, made all these adjustments and you know what a, what a tra- what an amazing job Alfred P Sloan had done getting GM organized to be effective uh, as a company. And then talked about, well, you know, but as the winds of change blow, the time is coming where they're going to have to do a similar kind of revisiting how they're going to do business or they're going to have problems once again. And, and uh, actually the, the, the changes that they made, the very things that rescued them under Alfred P. Sloan that made them into the giant that they, that they became are going to be the things that weigh them down like a millstone. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. I mean, it is, it is remarkable how... Uh, how much foresight he showed over and over again, and I couldn't help thinking over. You know, you talked about you couldn't think, you couldn't help but thinking about serving uh, over the course of the book. The other thing I kept thinking, I kept thinking about Steve Jobs in this book. There were a lot of different places where you know Jobs was. A, 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 there's so many places where Jobs was a guy with lots of big weaknesses, but man, did he have strengths. He's a guy who uh, was committed to a fault to saying no and to, to emphasizing whatever the one priority he had at that moment. And that was going to be the priority period. 
mm-hmm. and and just his rigorous uh, commitment to running his business, to running Apple, along a lot of the principles of this book, really stood out to me. Uh, yeah. And my guess is that that Jobs not only read this, but I, I I need to go back and find out how much Jobs and Drucker had contact, because my suspicion is that Jobs uh, used a lot of the stuff in here. Uh, to some degree as a, a bit of a playbook for how he did things uh, when he was running Apple as an executive, uh, because you could look over and over again. There were places where you'd just go, wow, yeah, that fits that fit. You know, jobs did that jobs followed that advice jobs or, you know, first thing he did when he took over Apple is he, he canned a bunch of projects, some of which were actually, you know, really innovative, really cool projects like the Newton, which eventually, you know, the Newton, was ahead of its time, but eventually, you know, the, the iPad was kind of revisiting a lot of what they were doing way back when, but jobs said, no, we're going to do this and this alone. And this is what we're going to, to, to be great at. And this is going to save the company. And that, that, those are hard decisions, but he was over and over again, willing to do that. And to some degree, that's why, or I mean, not just to some degree, that is why Apple became the behemoth that it became. So Mm -hmm. that, that to me, it stuck out as well that, that this book, uh, again, is it, it just you, you could probably do this with a ton of different uh, CEOs and executives over the over the years, and just keep going back to this and, and pointing out, oh yeah, they did it this way, and that that's why, because I, I think the principles really do re- really do work universally. Yeah. Well, and and it's one of these one of these books that gets me really interested in the in the author to where you know he's got thirty nine other books or thirty eight other than this one. Um, I'd, I'd like to read some of those in the future uh, because it, this one was just packed, packed full of, of great, great insight. All right. Well, that'll do it for us today uh, here on the on Books of Titans. Now, before we get out of here, just a reminder, you can follow along with us at booksoftitans.com. And if you want to buy any of these books, I should mention, you know, it would be very helpful if you clicked through the links on booksoftitans.com where we uh, would get a little bit of an affiliate uh, benefit from that. So uh, really appreciate it if that's uh, that's how you decide to, to consume some of these books can help support the podcast there. You can also ping us on Twitter or Instagram at Books of Titans. And if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast. You can find all of our po- uh, past episodes through Apple Podcasts, the Android Marketplace, Google Play, Stitcher, your podcast manager of choice, we're all over the place. And I found out today we have a page on Overcast. So if Overcast is your podcast of choice, uh, player of choice, we, um, we're definitely on there as well. Yep. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please make sure to recommend us through Overcast to give us five-star ratings on Apple Apple Podcasts. Again, it's, a, it's an imperfect system, but this is what really goes to, to spread the word and, and to move us up the rankings and uh, to get other people uh, listening to this show and uh, and helping with sponsors and all these other things that uh, that's that stuff's really important. So if you if you're enjoying this at all, please give us uh, good good reviews and five star ratings on uh, on your service of choice, and share your episode your favorite episodes on social media. We'll be back soon to discuss the next book, which will be Who by Jeff Smart and Randy Street. For Eric Rostad, I'm Jason Staples, and this has been the Books of Titans podcast. Keep reading, keep listening, keep improving. Thanks for listening and keep it real. I made this.